fix that problem. All right, um, so yes, I will uh, now get into this project and our developments for advancing the shape based course grading method. I'll start with a little bit of background. I'll get into what we did there um, and we will go from there. Is everything okay with the audio? Okay. Yeah, I've been hearing it for months actually. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, if there are any issues, uh, yeah, okay. Um, and also, I know there's QA time at the end, discussion time, but Feel free to stop me. Um, I have 40 slides, so I don't think I'll take the full hour, so we have some time. Anyway, so I'm sure most of you are familiar, but I'll start with some background on core screening and in protein modeling in particular, what core screening is. So core screening is really just a general term that refers to mapping some atomistic structure with a high number of degrees of freedom to one that is simpler or coarse with much fewer degrees of freedom. Martini is the popular offering I'm sure we've uh, used at some point. It's parameterized semi-empirically that it maps four atoms to one coarse grain bead. There are many different flavors, however, of coarse grain modeling. Um, so, um, and these different flavors employ differing levels of granularity. And typically that granularity is determined based on the use case or what questions the scientists seek to answer. Uh, with their course screening endeavor. So uh, in this um, panel, I'm showing a figure from a Greg Voss paper uh, where they parameterize these ultra coarse multimeric assemblies using principal component analysis to create these sort of hybrid models. So shape-based course training, um, again, which was developed in this group um, over 10 years ago, is a method of dimensionality reduction that preserves molecular shapes so in the original implementation, shape-based core screening was being utilized to create models with granularity somewhere between 100 to 150 atoms per core screen bead. Um, the membrane bending mechanism of, uh, sorry, F-bar domains bending with the membranes, for instance, was one application of this study um, that I think both Anton and Hong had done uh, at different stages. Um, and Anton employed this method to study the mechanisms of deformation of the hepatitis B virus capsid. So with this level of granularity, which is much more coarse than something like Martini, uh, the simulations are amenable to these long time scale uh, simulations. So for instance, in excess of 10 microseconds using a very large time step, integration time step, to look at things like uh, recovery and irreversible deformation. So I'll get into so for this uh, paper, I think it was 100 femtoseconds per step, most likely. Um, so yeah, and it's variable depending on how granular you make the model. So just some background on shape-based course screening and how this works. Um, this methodology reproduces molecular shapes with 3D Voronoi tessellation. So it employs a special algorithm, which I'll discuss a little bit in the following slides to reproduce these spatial partitions. So here we have a two-dimensional diagram of Voronoi tessellation and in the middle of three-dimensional Voronoi tessellation. And the idea is that with your atomistic structure, if you employ this adaptation process that we'll discuss later, you can equipartition the space around your atomistic structure and group atoms together based on some number of beads. So if you say I want 10 coarse grain beads to represent this structure, the algorithm will subdivide your, your space or the, the domain of your atomistic molecule into 10 roughly equally sized partitions. So what that looks like, um, just with a 2D cartoon example, and this is sort of the conceptual back end of this process, it's called competitive heavy and adaptation. So it's a similar to a type of unsupervised learning where you start with some, and so you have a, a domain of atoms, which are the blue circles in this diagram, and you start with some user determined number of beads, which are in green. And by invoking this process where we iteratively adapt the positions of the coarse grain beads uh, relative to the atomistic domain, which is referred to as the input pattern, you slowly uh, resolve this equipartition of your system. So, um, as I mentioned in this slide, uh, 
their resulting feed positions and their connections. So bonds represent adjacent Voronoi cells. And then properties such as mass and charge are assigned based on the atoms that are present in the given Voronoi polyhedron. So what that means in particular, it's a pretty simple formulation. So following the tessellation, you have some of the polyhedron. You have atoms, which again are shown in blue here, and we map the properties in a very straightforward way. So in this case, for mass, we simply sum the atomic masses of the beads. Uh, and now for things like charge, um, you start to sort of see this problem emerging. So in this example, we have our atoms A, B, and C, and B have charges of negative one, and charge uh, the charge on BC is positive two. So you perform the averaging and suddenly your CGB is chargeless. Um, so you have this problem where granularity is a direct limit on how much detail you can capture in your first frame model and things like charge and hydrophobicity are critical for maintaining stability of molecular assemblies. So what that meant in some of the original applications of this work, such as Anton's work on HPV acid, was the direct parameterization, it's getting a little laggy, um, the parameterization of, for instance, interdomain bonds that are meant to preserve stability. So in um, capsid assemblies, which I'm sure many of you are familiar, if you lose details such as charge, hydrophobicity, you start to need to make inclusions in your model to accommodate for their shortcomings. Um, so for HIV, uh, which is a system that you know we study a lot and which was the motivating force behind looking at this method, we know that the charge profile is highly detailed. So here's a, just a charge density grid um, using Volcool and BMD showing it some different cutoffs to show sort of the negative and positive charge details. And you can see how, um, yeah, there are a lot of features. It's a very feature-rich charge profile. If we were interested, for instance, in the interactions of small molecules, which I showed in my second slide, they too have very detailed charge profiles. So if you want to apply something like this coarse grain modeling, you need to capture those details. Well, if we try and apply a very coarse level, similar to what Anton did, um, we average out all of our charge detail. Hydrophobicity is the same. So for something like Helix-1 and HRDCA, which is very feature-rich, you can see it here, colored by charge. If we apply our CG reduction, we lose basically all of the information. So why not simply add more beads? Well, in the original implementation of CG tools or uh, the shape-based coarse grain builder in CG builder and BMD, there's a hard limit on the granularity that you can obtain with this method. So this is sort of you know just a snapshot of what you see as a user if you're using the original implementation. Um, anything beyond you know 40 to 50 atoms per bead granularity, the tool cannot converge. And actually, the problem is really straightforward, and we were able to implement a very simple fix. The problem is caused by reflexive connections. So in learning theory. If you have two neurons that are indistinguishable, they have the same state, the same weights and biases, their stimuli are identical, then their connection is said to be reflexive, so they're interchangeable. In CG Builder, if you initialize, you, so in this diagram, we're looking at initial states. Um, we have five CG beads here for the 22 atoms, but two of them start in the same position as two other beads. Suddenly, the, the software will not converge, the algorithm will not converge, and at the end, we have a failure of assignment for which the solution is to run again or try to reduce the number of beads. Well, like I said, our fix is really simple, so we figured out that it was caused by these reflexive connections, um, and I wrote just a simple simulator that for a given number of beads can predict the number of failures. And we started to look more into this tool and we implemented an incredibly simple fix, which is really to implement an exclusivity condition when we initialize the states of neurons. So there's some pseudocode here. It's uh, very straightforward. Basically, all we do is we maintain a record of which atoms have been used as initial states for our CG uh, molecule prior to network optimization. And if there's a redundancy in the initial states, then we pick another one. So uh, it's a really simple fix, but what it allows us to do is to now create models with theoretically 
and you know we could have a one to one so one CGB per atom which wouldn't be very useful but um, so now we can extend the limits of what we can achieve with this so here's uh, an animation of this process so this is for HIV CA um, we have 100 beads which is approximately 35 atoms per bead and you can see the optimization slowly converging where each bead is equipartitioned within the atomistic domain. So now that we can create these more granular models, we wanted to come up with some quantitative metric to actually select or uh, to, yeah, to, to choose and to validate a level of granularity. For that, we, we wanted to look at charge densities again because we know that charge profiles for these types of molecules, structural proteins are very important. So with our ability to create models with increased granularity. We did some, some initial testing and we saw that we slowly converge to the atomistic charge density by adding more beads, which makes sense because of how charge is assigned. So to quantify this, we used a spatial correlation analysis known as Fourier shell correlation, which maybe some of you guys are familiar with. Um, so FSC measures a cross-correlation histogram in a reciprocal domain, so it's one over angstrom spatial frequency between two independently derived data sets. So in short, what that really means is you have some complex signal in real space. We decompose it uh, into constituent frequencies in reciprocal space. And FSC shown here is really just measuring that cross-correlation histogram, and it tells you um, how how well your models agree spatially. And in this case, we're comparing these charge densities. So we're comparing each of these to the atomistic reference. So our initial results for this were pretty interesting as we sort of expected as we add more beads, the level of agreement between our course models and the atomistic charge density approached the sub nanometer resolution. So depending on which metric we use to estimate the resolution, uh, which um, is a topic maybe for a different, another talk, um, but um, employing, you know, this gold standard metric that the cryo-electron microscopists use, or this sort of more stringent half metric, um, we were able to actually quantify how well our models agree. So what we did was we used, in addition to HIV-CA, we used two other different models. So these, this is human copaline 2 and this is actin, which form the cytoskeletal filaments throughout the cells in our body. Uh, each dot in this analysis represents a different coarse grain structure. We compute the charge density and then we compute the FSC and we look to see where our models fall below the sub angstrom resolution. Uh, and we see a relatively similar trend for copaline. We generated even higher granularity models or more granular models. Um, but we see this, this sort of uh, point beyond which we know that the charge densities of our models can form relatively well. So I'll stick with HIV-CA because that was sort of the motivating structure for this project, but this was the model that we were able to come up with. Um, so this sequence of CA that we used has 221 residues. We employed, we saw that 210 beads we could get or greater, we could get sub nanometer resolution. So we chose 221 because it matches one residue per bead. Uh, and you can see uh, our models, here's the charge density. And on the right is the van der Waals radii of the resulting spheres overlaid with the molecular surface of our atomistic models. So you can see the, the match is almost perfect. So the shape is, is totally well preserved. So now we have this method of generating these more detailed models, and we, we need a way to parameterize them, to simulate them. So, tip, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I think that's a good way to start it. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you uh, lessen the incidence or you have fewer incidences of that problem. When, if you can include more details, yeah, you're less likely to average anything out. Yeah. 
Good question. Yeah, so that's sort of what we were starting to get at with this analysis. We wanted to see for, for very different structures, like, I mean, acting and copolin are very different from each other, which are both very different from CA. We wanted to see if there was a golden rule. Um, I think I can't answer that just yet. We need to really test this with many more, you know, more than three or four test cases to be able to say for certain. But um, generally, uh, if you exceed 15, if you get more granular than 15 atoms per bead, I'd say that's a pretty safe bet. Um, yeah. And you don't need to do, um, I mean, this is like, I'm showing the high granularity shape based coarse screening. Of course, you can still do the lower granularity side if you're willing to add ad hoc interactions and do other things to maintain stability. But yeah, for the sub nanometer, I'd say anything less than 15 or, you know, around that. Um, so, yeah, so with uh, these higher granularity models, we wanted to actually simulate them, uh, which is a whole different problem. So historically, this is done with this Boltzmann inversion. So this is what the method was really built on. The idea of Boltzmann inversion is really straightforward. As you can see here, we derive bond and angle force constants based on the MSD. So um, it's a simple Boltzmann weighted MSD. You derive the constants from atomistic data, and then you derive them from the shape based coarse grain data, and you look at how they conform. And this is terrible. Um, and the idea, the thinking behind Boltzmann inversion is that every bond and every angle is independent. They're not coupled, and we can optimize them independently. That's just flat out not true. Um, it's, it's obvious. And also, as we have these higher granularity models, it's especially not true. We have even overlapping or redundant degrees of freedom. Um, so we'll discuss um, sort of the first. Uh, so there were several attempts, I think, between both Han, which was the most recent, and Anton for solving this problem. Anton scales his force constants by some constant factor, and Han employs this iterative refinement procedure, which is shown here. So for some refinement iteration, I plus one, you derive the constants from iteration i and you subtract you know, the error minus some scaling constant. So this is what Han had come up with. And we liked this formulation because it's unsupervised, it's pretty straightforward, and it really only involves performing a parameter sleep to see which M and N constants between zero and one are most optimal for scaling your error. So in this case, we performed this group sweep. So we, we swept, as I said, from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9 for both N and N, and we plot the RMC from one single iteration. So the root mean squared error from the previous iteration compared to the, the present iteration. And what's kind of interesting here is you can see that bonds and angles seem somewhat coupled, um, at least more so according to the heat map, whereas angles not so much. Um, and we so we derived our parameters. We sort of set up this two-phase refinement. We thought, well, maybe we can optimize bonds first and then angles second and do this, you know, two-phase framework. Uh, and the results were not very great. So um, this is an animation showing the iter iterative refinement. So this shows two phases. You, you can kind of see visually when the, the force top or the M and N constants change. Um, Sorry, it's, the quality is not great on that, um, but we're showing the error here. And, and the basic idea is that bonds did okay, uh, but angles especially, the, the fit error, is, it's just an untenable optimization problem. And as I sort of hinted at earlier, this problem is really caused by redundant connectivity, in this case, angle parameters. Um, that strains the optimization. So with these highly granular models, this is our 221 bead model of CA, highly connected beads are involved in many angle parameters and the behavior of a bead, um, like in terms of network theory, the behavior of any node is sort of dominated by its strongest connections. So it's the same for these models. And the way that we proved that was um, by for each angle, we we looked at the connectivity, so the number of connections that were associated with each bead at each angle, and we plot these, these the x-axis are aligned by angle number, and we plot these so we can see that 
Um, and I've shaded some exemplary regions red here. So when the connectivity is high, we have really poor fit. When the connectivity is low, such as in these green regions, we have great fit. Um, so we, we took steps to sort of prove, yeah. That's one. So, so this, in this case, it is the molecular connectivity. So the bonding structure, the bonded structure of the molecule is based on the connectivity, atomistic or backbone. It's a user parameter. Um, you can have many, yeah. So, and that's so. Um, in this, I guess is. So if there are, so if there are atoms that exist that are mapped to, to be, that if there's a path that binds them in the structure, then, then they're bound here. So this is really similar if you are familiar with elastic network models. If we were to remove all of the angles, or the angle parameters and have this dominated solely by bonded interactions, it would be similar to an elastic network model. Right. Does. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, mm, yeah. And we still have, like, you can see here in this diagram, we have these regions. So if this is the CIP A binding region, CA. We still represent it anyway. Uh, but yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, so, like I said, we took some additional steps to validate this. We looked at so where, how bad are our parameters being violated? So, for each of these, it's the atomistic reference value versus what we produce in the core strain. We see some of these trends that I brought up earlier. Weak force constants are in the neighborhood of stronger constants, and they're being overpowered. Suddenly, you have a violation, and the fit is terrible. Well, the way that we did this uh, was by removing excess angle parameters. So we wanted angles in the model. We didn't want something similar to an ENM. We still wanted angles, and we came up with a way to remove them. So this is our fit, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss how we do that in the next slide, but um, we came up with this method that we refer to as pruning, where we basically retain only the strongest angle parameters in our model. And what this looks like, um, and this is an overview of our complete refinement process. So we have um, just in this left column, this is your SBCB moiety. So for every bead, we take the angles that are associated with the bead and we sort them based on their strength. And rather simply anything that's not the strongest angle, we simply just remove from the model. So the result of this uh, is that you have a topology where there's no overlap between any two angle parameters. Um, and we extended this to three test cases and the results are shown here. So on the left, we ran different numbers, but at least 10 refinement iterations to generate this fit, which you can see looks terrible. The RNLC is shown in the top right. After we apply this simple pruning procedure, even just a few more iterations, we generate this perfect fit or near perfect where our, our atomistic behavior is, is well captured. So um, following all of the the construction steps in this parameter optimization, removing excess angles, you can then finally take your monomer that you parameterized. In this case, we'll, we'll look at HIV CA and you can construct a capsid. So on the left is sort of what happens if you if you try to simulate a capsid with the initial unrefined parameters. You can it's actually a movie, you probably can't even tell it looks so bad. There's really not even dynamics. And on the right, we have our shape-based coarse grain cone with the parameters that we generated. Oh, there we go. And you can see, uh, and there are no interactions here. There's no, um, like, nothing cheesy. You know, we're not enforcing inter-monomer, inter-domain interactions. It's all sort of natural as it's popped out of this framework. And if you're familiar with HIV structure, you can see things like the CIPA binding loops are very dynamic. Um, so we're actually seeing, you know, there's dynamical relevance with this model. Um, you can even see it shrinks a little as we equilibrate. This is about 300 nanoseconds uh, that, you know, we ran in an afternoon um, because these models are, are very performance efficient. So to quantify the size for you guys, so this is um, a pretty simple system. 
So we have sodium chloride and we use CG sodium chloride. We just create using the standard combination rules. Um, we have plus one and minus one charges and each one represents a grouping of um, four Na and four Cl for D. We have of course bring IP6, which I showed you kind of in that second slide um, as an assembly cofactor uh, which sits in the middle of each of these hexameric and pentameric pores. And then we have our CA conical capsid. So this is about 340,000 beads in total. The system of the same exact cone with solvent is 77 million beads. Um, so at 340,000 beads, we're getting to that sweet spot of what can fit in GPU memory. Um, so that's what we're excited about. We can we can run these really fast. Um, well, V100 is what we've been running on primarily. I'll show you, actually, I'll show just V100 today. But we've been working with um, Dave Clark and we've been running on the A100s, the DGX A100. Um, but yeah, so like this is sort of that sweet, yeah, that sweet spot. Um, and with things like NAND 3 with SMD support, we can now run these types of simulations. So this is sort of the, um, this is the goal of, of why we were interested in pursuing something at this course level of theory. Um, we want to look at, for instance, the mechanical properties of these capsids. This is an atomic force microscopy simulation. So um, we do a nano indentation where we indent the capsid and we look over some length of time at how the capsid responds, how it recovers. This was a very fast push. So we can't yet correlate these forces to an experiment. You know, this is like a bullet. Um, but, you know, we still see these force profiles um, and that gives us opportunities to compare to force versus Z from AFM experiments. So we can do kind of weirder, freakier stuff. Um, we call these alien simulations where we put the tip inside of the capsid and push it from the inside out um, and look at how it, how it ruptures. And we can compare the force profile on the tip um, in a directional dependent way. So we can look to see if it's stronger in one direction versus another. Um, so we were kind of pretty excited about that. And uh, one of the last things we've done with this uh, is to simulate four translocations. So this is incredibly rudimentary uh, at this stage, but we still see some interesting behavior. We see recovery of the capsid over about 70 nanoseconds. In this case, I have some snapshots here. Um, and you can see in the beginning of this trajectory how it sort of bulges to accommodate the decrease in radius as it translocates through the fork. Uh, and so, as I had mentioned, this is we're really interested in this from a performance uh, perspective. So, I'll show you some V100 benchmarks here that we obtained with NAND3. So, depending on if we want to use PME for long range electrostatics or not, um, we can exceed one microsecond per day performance for this system and for that active copeland system I showed you guys of different sizes um, without PME. So using truncated dynamics, um, we actually recover scaling. Uh, so you can see like for this three turn filament, there's you know the load balancing, maybe there's some some things that need to be addressed with how we synthesize the PME grid. But we're sort of approaching four microseconds per day. And these are um, systems that are, you know, half a micrometer scale in size. So we're really excited about that. Um, so for this one, the time step is actually 15. Um, so I should have, I didn't include any of that in this um, in this talk. Uh, we just published the preprint for this paper yesterday. Um, and in that, we show how we calculate the time step. It's based on the bonded, the oscillation theory. So like after you do the refinement, you look at the whole topology and you sort of take the fastest frequency. So that's your time step. That's how we determine it. Um, so yeah, the, uh, yeah, so, but and for this one on the left, it's 48 temporal seconds per step. This is the HIV conical capsule, and this is that one and two bound acting filament and three different lengths of that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's all we've prepared for you guys. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're doing.
stars, so we do ten ions. You have said you have four ions, but um, you only have one chop, right? Um, yeah, so that I maybe didn't explain that very well. So we have we have um represented it like we have a positively charged coarse grain ion and a negatively charged one. Each one really represents a grouping of eight. So four sodium and four chloride, and then it's like one additional sodium for the positive one. So yeah, and that's that was what Anton had done in his 2009 paper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sort of. It's like the block atom selection stuff. So I was really amazed by the recovery of the capsule. Yeah. Structure. You know, when you put the tip on top, it then goes back. Nice. Yeah. From the inside or then the pulling through that board. So uh, you said that you did. How do you describe the interaction? Where the where the date? So the Leonard Jones parameter. So the Van der Waals radii and the epsilon well depth. We use the same formulation that Anton did. Oh, yes. um, so for the Van der Waals radii, it's the radius of gyration of the atoms that are bounded in that Borno cell. For the epsilon well depth, um, it's a ratio of the hydrophobic to total solvent accessible surface area. And there's like this user parameter, which is your max well depth. And then you sort of vary all the interactions between zero and that max based on the hydrophobic and total SASA. The shape complement that would be that's I think it does, yeah. Better. Yeah, so you mean, don't have anything inside this. No, no water this, or yeah, this is empty. So, where are the ions? Oh, the ions are there, they're just not shown. Okay, yeah, so this is one ring, the yeah, space kind of exactly. There are about I think 6,000 ions in this system that corresponds to about 150 million more. Oh, okay, yeah. So then we we it, exactly yes yeah. so we use like a longevin damping of two inverse picoseconds with a dielectric of 80 and that sort of mimics that some of the macroscopic you know charge screening of viscosity of water yeah very nice yeah yeah yeah, that's that's a good suggestion. We oh, someone in our group was working with GNG, uh, the growing neural network gas. Um, and we never tried or thought to use it here for this purpose, but I think it, it could work. Yeah, it's a little bit more adaptive, right? And less, yeah, less rigid. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. So I understand that you have an updated version of the shape that's supposed to be Yep. So does that also get you the potential energy terms, uh, the plug in, or is it something? It does. Like, yeah. Yeah, you mean um uh oh, yeah, so the force yeah, so we sent it um to John uh now I don't know if maybe you're too busy with other stuff. Oh, okay. All right. Um I, yeah. I can make it available to all these guys. No, yeah, that maybe that good. would be better for now. Yeah, I forgot Juan did mention that. I haven't spent too much. Like, I want to build in the GUI for this refinement stuff, the pruning. It's all automated. So we've set it up in this way that's hopefully easy for people to use. Yeah. So you just, yeah, you need one atomistic simulation. Um, and like, so I met with the COVID virus team earlier and they've got this five microsecond spike simulation. So you could use that out of the box. You don't need to run anything new. Um, you could parameterize your course model with that. Um, and then, so there, I guess are different um, 
that's the way to say it. So different philosophies, I guess, on how you want to do this. Boltzmann inversion is state dependent. So for the HIV capsid, for instance, I ran a trimer of dimers iteratively, which is thought to be the assembly construct or the basic subunit of assembly. Um, so yeah, we you run only one atomistic simulation and then you give the initial parameters to your model and then you just follow this workflow. So it's a short simulation with, you know, with a 48 femtosecond time step, each refinement iteration is, you know, takes maybe four or five minutes. Yeah, so you, it's really something you can do in an afternoon. Um, so then we only have to worry about the liquids and mm -hmm. make it out of there. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't, we really haven't looked at lipids yet. It's only nucleic acid and protein. Um, and I sort of alluded to Hong's work earlier. And Hong, uh, yeah, I don't have any of the lipid membrane here. But yeah, so he's got a membrane underneath of this F bar domain. And as far as I remember, each lipid is two beads. Um, so it's very simple. I think he built it, he built it himself. He didn't use shape based coarse grain or anything. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe that. Okay. Yeah. Which I think for, you know, in a lot of like biomolecular modeling, like the lipid membrane and stuff kind of gets pushed. You know, it's, it's there and you want it there, but you don't really care about it. You know, it's like you care more about your transmembrane proteins and stuff like that. So I think if you're willing to get a work rate around lipid, you could use this method, like you could take, you know, simulation of a small patch of lipids, you could extract out a single molecule, probably of each type, and you could parameterize a shape force model. I'm not sure how much better it'd be than using something like that, um, but yeah. <laughs> That remains to be seen. Um, I think my belief is we could, um, especially with a, you know, if you're willing to take the model pretty coarse or pretty granular, sorry. Um, so higher detail, more beads. I think you could do it. Um, we've seen some interesting stuff, for instance, with this, these filaments. So um, this, uh, you know, cytoskeletal acting and each of these red monomers is copaline 2 and it, it's meant to promote disassembly of the filament. And in some of our simulations, we actually see it disassembling in the way that's expected, which is kind of interesting. I didn't show any of that here, but I think for large scale global motions like spike opening or, you know, it's bending motions and stuff like that, I, I think you would see it for sure. Yeah. But we'd have to test it. <laughs> yeah. Confirm. Um, so this is the um, it's the neural network gas algorithm. So the Martinets and Schulten from like ninety four, ninety five, um, and it's um, heavy and adaptation is the name of the process that they. Uh, there we go. Um, so it's basically this, okay, so like the idea between that, I kind of glanced over all of this, but like this heavy and learning theory idea is like neurons that fire together, wire together. So like you have two neural units and the strength of the connection between those two units is proportional to their like covariance. Really. So like their correlation or whenever they're both active, they're connected or more strongly connected. So that's this idea with this heavy and adaptation process. Um, so you slowly evolve your set of pointers to your input pattern, which in this case is your atomistic molecule, um, based on its proximity to features in the input pattern. Um, and then that's this uh, short algorithm here. So you're checking the distance and you're basically establishing um, the position of your pointer inside the domain that's closer to you know your feature than any other um, and you create the the Vorme tessellation um yeah sorry how long does it take to do a first grade model on say well i think i do this you know what does it uh, have to say i think it's like six million 
Yeah, so to build, um, so do you mean like going from constructing the subunit to then having a cap? Yeah, the I, um, so if you do it the way that I sort of outlined here, where you course grain a single subunit and then you map the subunit to the capsid, um, maybe in 30 minutes. But if you want it to actually like uh, pass, like as an input pattern, all of the coordinates of the capsid to this heavy and adaptation process that um, Martinets and Schulten developed, you know, way back, I think it would take a while. <laughs> uh, Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, um, no, I was giving you sort of like the total human time. Yes. Yeah. yeah, this is grad student time. Yeah. Um, no, the actual time crunching numbers. So running this uh, adaptation process, maybe seven or eight minutes for the level of granularity that we're talking about here and that performance timing you know like i i'm estimating it right now but when we did this analysis and generated these sweeps of you know coarse grain molecules i, I was sort of sort of collecting some benchmark data there but yeah this is all tcl yeah believe it or not um it's not incredibly heavy it scales obviously like you know it's as you're adding more beads, it's slowing down. Yeah, um, but it runs pretty well. I mean, but it would be, I think, a great target for porting it, just writing it in C and just wrapping it in TCL. It might already exist in some form. Like there might be in BMD somewhere. But, uh, yeah, you don't think so? <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad we settled that. Yeah, but I can tell you also that that's yeah, speaking my advice to Mm -hmm. I think using a soup like we were talking about the, the block atom selection, it's like I almost wonder if something like that would make it possible, but I'd I think it would involve first like doing a block decomposition of your whole atomistic sure. domain and then it might be possible um but i'd have to look into that <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on the so performance you want, you want to work first. yeah exactly so yeah. First, you know, the fun stuff comes after <laughs> exactly yeah right. yeah i'm waiting for oh I actually don't know if he's, he, he actually saw this thought. I showed it to him earlier, um, but I don't think he's in here. Unless, he, he, oh, there's nobody. Okay. I think maybe, they're recording. Maybe he doesn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. But yeah, he, he did ask me a lot of questions earlier. So I can, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's time. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm. I want people to use it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, okay. So we can stop sharing. Okay, great. Good. Excellent. So you're done. Yeah. Uh, thank you all, and yeah. Thank you. And I. So I just leave this. Uh, wait, you might be in here. Oh no. Oh, there he is. He's just not a panelist. He was oh. in here. Oh, 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 yeah. I see. I see. there. Q and A. So if he's not a panelist, then he cannot. Yeah, but oh, he's he oh, oh my God. He didn't promote him to. I. Yeah, I guess not. So let me see if I can do that. There is. I hope so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be seeing you at the front. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. No, can you hear us?
Are you there? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Questions? Uh, no, I, I like you said, I we met earlier, so I asked my questions then. Um, oh, I got muted. Okay, no, you can't talk to me. Uh, no, I didn't have any questions. Like I, like you said, we met earlier, so I asked then. Maybe we can hear you on my phone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. No, I didn't have any questions. Like you said, we met earlier, and so I asked them then. <laughs> okay. okay, we got Good. him out of the way. Just wanted to make sure that uh -huh. you're not trying to ask any questions. Okay. Thank see you. you. All right, see ya.